we live in a very selfish world. Uh, you and I see it on a daily basis, don't we? Especially now with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, maybe when you go into a grocery store and you see people shopping and they're hoarding, uh, taking way too many items, more than what they need. Why do people act this way? It is due to selfishness. A few months back, a woman played a twisted prank in a Pennsylvania grocery store. She purposely coughed on about $35,000 worth of food. Now, all of that food had to be thrown out, according to the supermarket. One of the co-owners of the grocery chain said this, quote, I am absolutely sick to my stomach about the loss of food. While it is always a shame when food is wasted, and these times when so many people are worried about the security of our food supply, it is even more disturbing, end of quote. So we see people's actions today are largely due to selfishness. And it should not surprise us as Jehovah's people because Jesus Christ told us what we would see happening during the time period that we are living in. According to Jesus' words at Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, there Jesus said, because of the increasing of lawlessness, the love of the greater number will grow cold. We see that being fulfilled right now before our very eyes. The world we live in today is dominated by greed, materialism, immorality, racial prejudice, national bigotry, all of these things exercise a powerful influence upon people. So as Jehovah's people, we have to be very careful. We want to avoid imitating the spirit of the world by being selfish. Now, when we think of the word selfish or selfishness, how can we define that term? According to Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, selfishness is seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. Now, from that definition, clearly selfishness is unloving and is self-defeating. So again, as Jehovah's people, uh, we want to make sure that we're keeping our spiritual guard up so that we don't allow the world's selfishness to make inroads into our Christ-like new personality. There are people in the world today who are very materialistic, and they are never happy because they never have enough. What about those who are dishonest? Uh, these dishonest individuals, they often pay for their crimes with a bad conscience, maybe even imprisonment. And then what about those in the world who are sexually immoral? Well, these ones often pay with a broken home, a tortured conscience, and sometimes they even contract a sexually transmitted disease. So we see the results of selfishness. Uh, regardless of any gains that they think they're making, these selfish, lawless ones, they have nothing. Why? Because they don't have love. So all of us as true worshipers of Jehovah God, we are totally different from selfish people in the world. Our loving Heavenly Father Jehovah wants us to express love. But what does this require? Let's take a few minutes and examine two individuals who set the superlative example for us when it comes to displaying love. Now, you already know who these two are. It's our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, and His Son, Jesus Christ. So first, let's talk about our Father, Jehovah. When we think of love, we know that love is the very opposite of selfishness. So when we read in God's Word, the Bible, about love, Often we think of the Greek term agape, which is a love that's guided or governed by principle. That's the type of love Jehovah has. Agape is a love that can only be known from the actions it prompts. Now, very interesting, the Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines love this way. Unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another. That's a nice definition from the dictionary because it almost coincides with Jehovah's definition of what we see in the Bible. We see the Bible highlights principled love. Uh, this love involves unselfish devotion to righteousness. It involves an active concern for the lasting welfare of others. 
So we know that according to God's word, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us God is love. Yes, Jehovah is the personification of love. He embodies that quality. It is his most dominant quality, his most important one. So Jehovah does not just possess love. He is the personification of love. In other words, everything he does is guided by that quality. So God's love is evident for us when we look at uh, Jehovah's creative works. It's evident in the things he's created for our enjoyment. So we can pull up image number one, and as you look at your devices, see this helps us to appreciate what Jehovah has done when we think about the love he has for us as humans. As you look at your devices, you see that Jehovah has created beautiful flowers. Uh, they're not drab, but we have a variety of colors. Uh, notice the butterfly, uh, how delicate and how beautiful butterflies are. The variety of food, look at the variety of fruit, uh, very delicious for us. And then, the beautiful sunsets Jehovah provides. It is as if Jehovah takes out his paintbrush. He's this great artist who makes these masterpieces for us to enjoy. You can take that image down. Thank you so much. So it's evident that Jehovah God really cares for us. He loves us as his creation, as humans. It's evident too, according to the scriptures, that Jehovah God is merciful. We know his love is unfailing. Now, what about the second person? Let's talk about his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus imitates his heavenly father. Jesus Christ also has perfect love. When he was on the earth conducting his ministry, uh, Jesus loved his followers to the end. And not just the end of his life, but even to the end of his ministry. And when Jesus was conducting his ministry, even when he was tired, he had love for others. He cared for others' spiritual needs. He had pity on people. Jesus cured the sick and even raised the dead. And of course, Jesus actually performed one of the greatest acts of love. He surrendered his life for his followers. So let's look at image number two. As you look at your devices, here we see Jesus Christ hanging on the torture stake. This is the greatest manifestation of love ever shown to us as humans by Jehovah and his son, Jesus. We never want to take the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ for granted. Without that sacrifice, we would not even be able to approach Jehovah in prayer. We wouldn't be able to ask Jehovah to forgive us of our sins. We love our heavenly father and we love his son, Jesus, for giving us this ultimate gift, the ransom sacrifice of Christ. You can take that image down. Thank you so much. So we should want to imitate Jehovah and Jesus by expressing love. So in order to help us to do that, we have to look at what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 30, 39. Again, that's Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 36 to 39. I invite you to open your copy of the Bible there with me. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36, and notice what Jesus said. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to him, you must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second like it is this, you must love your neighbor as yourself. So we see the man that asked Jesus this question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Uh, Jesus responded by saying, we have to love Jehovah first with every fiber of our being. Our entire existence is wrapped up in showing love for Jehovah. But then Jesus also said, we have to have love for our neighbor, just like we love ourselves. So our closest neighbor will be our family members. If we're married, it will be our wife, our mate our children, our brothers and sisters in our spiritual family and the congregation. And then those who are not yet servants of Jehovah, we have to express love to them as well. When we fulfill what Jesus said in this scripture, this is proving that we are true worshipers of Jehovah. This is the identifying mark of true Christians. 
In view of the foregoing, we have to ask ourselves a question. In what specific ways can you and I express love? But now the remainder of our discussion will focus upon what the Apostle Paul recorded for us is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We invite you to turn there in your copy of the Bible. And this is what the remainder of our discussion will focus on. We're going to look at specific ways we can imitate Jehovah and Jesus when it comes to expressing love. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to consider verses 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag, does not get puffed up, does not behave indecently, does not look for its own interests, does not become provoked, it does not keep account of the injury, it does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Now, as you look at the words Jehovah inspired the Apostle Paul to write, he mentions nine things that love is not and seven things that love is. So let's go through these and look for specific ways. Uh, think about how you can imitate what Jehovah is asking us to do in these scriptures when it comes to showing love within your family circle, within the congregation, and helping those who are not yet servants of Jehovah. So as you look at the first one, it says, love is patient and kind. So this type of love prompts patient forbearance in unfavorable circumstances. The Greek word for long suffering is literally rendered having longness of spirit, according to the kingdom interlinear. Now, what do we get from that expression? Having longness of spirit. See, it denotes calm endurance, a slowness to anger. We can illustrate it this way. For those of you who are married in the congregation, think back to when you were newlyweds. Were you patient when you were newlyweds? Your wife made a dish for you, but it wasn't quite like you remember how your mom made that dish. You knew better than to compare that to your mother's recipe. However, in time, your wife's dish surpassed what your mother used to make. What took place? Patience, kindness. See, patience and kindness go hand in glove. And no doubt today, you love your wife's cook. So showing kindness involves taking an active interest in the welfare of others. It involves engaging in friendly and helpful acts and favors. And we start at home by expressing this type of love. And then we do it with our brothers and sisters in the congregation, and also when it comes to helping others as we conduct our ministry. Notice the next one says, love is not jealous. So here's a personal question for self-examination. Am I resentful if another gets a service privilege instead of me? That's a good question to ponder. So when you think about that question, it helps us to understand that if we allow jealousy to take root in our heart, it actually conveys the idea of a negative emotion toward a suspected rival or one believed to be enjoying an advantage. Such jealousy is selfish, it's not loving, and it spawns hatred, not love. If left unchecked, it could actually disrupt the peace of the congregation. Yes, love helps us not to view it as a personal affront when someone receives praise for some exceptional ability or outstanding achievement. Our next one says, it does not brag. Love does not brag, it does not get puffed up. So do we boast about our accomplishments and downgrade others? That wouldn't be loving. See, love would restrain us from flaunting our talents or accomplishments. If we truly love our brothers, how could we constantly brag about our success in the ministry or our privileges in the congregation? Such boasting can actually tear others down. It could cause them to feel inferior to us in comparison. So love does not allow us to brag about what Jehovah allows us to do in his service. After all, 
love does not get puffed up. Or as the New Testament in modern English says, love does not cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Yes, love prevents us from having an elevated view of ourselves. Now, the next expression, it says, love does not behave indecently. In other words, it's not rude, uh, does not act improperly. The Greek term translated behave indecently uh, may include the idea of acting disgracefully in a moral sense or conducting oneself rudely, a person lacking good manners, or acting in a way that dishonors. So we can show Christian love by the way we treat those who take the lead in the congregation. As an example, at times, uh, well-known representatives of the Christian congregation, perhaps your circuit overseer, Bethelites, uh, members of the branch committee, members of the governing body, as well as their helpers, may attend a convention or a theocratic event that we also attend. Naturally, we want to show such brothers and their wives due respect. But could we even unintentionally show a lack of good manners? Could we find ourselves behaving indecently by going to the extreme? While we appreciate having an opportunity to meet and talk with these brothers and sisters, we would show a lack of respect if we tried to treat them as celebrities. For example, it would show bad manners if we tried to take candid photos of them without their permission, maybe while they're eating or engaging in other activities. Would we go up to them and ask them to autograph our books and Bibles? Would we push ahead in front of others and aggressively demand that our photo be taken with them. If we behave that way, what effect could that behavior have on those who are attending our assemblies or theocratic events for the first time? It could stumble them. Yes, these brothers and their dear wives, they want to be treated not as celebrities. No, they want to be treated as our fellow brothers and sisters. Why? because love does not behave indecently. Notice the next expression says, love does not look for its own interests. Now, according to the revised standard version, it says love does not insist on its own way. So a loving person does not demand that everything be done his way, as if his opinions were always correct. See, a loving person will not try to manipulate others using his powers of persuasion to wear down for those who have a different view. If we really love our brothers, we will respect their views, and where possible, we will show a willingness to yield. And then this type of love will actually be love in action. If we're not looking for our own interest, that means we're looking to help ones in the congregation. We're interested in our young ones, our elderly brothers and sisters, those who are infirm. See, now this love is active. It's not selfish. We're not looking for our own interests. The next one says, love does not become frivolous. We think of our congregation elders because they set an outstanding example by reacting lovingly, even when we're slow to respond to counsel. Think of our congregation secretaries who do not allow themselves to become provoked when we are forgetful, or maybe we're slower, we have the habit of turning in our field service reports late. These elders do not become provoked, and we love our elders for not allowing that to happen. Now, none of us are perfect. None of us should become offended by what others say or do. True, it is only natural to become upset when others offend us. But even if we become justifiably angry Love does not allow us to remain provoked. Our next one says, love does not keep account of the injury. So forgiveness is a facet of love. Since we need forgiveness, we have to be willing to forgive others. Isn't that what Jesus taught us in the model prayer at Matthew chapter 6, verse 12? That Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So we don't want to act like we have a ledger or we're keeping a scorecard of 
a record of hurtful words or deeds as if writing them down so that we won't forget. See, love will prevent us from harboring grudges. Our next expression Paul made is this, does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Moffat's translation renders it this way, love is never glad when others go wrong. That's a nice rendition. But of course, the superior translation, the New World translation, does not rejoice over unrighteousness, does not rejoice with the truth, or rejoices with the truth, rather. We can't get any better than the superior translation, the New World translation. So love finds no pleasure in unrighteousness. So that means you and I, we shouldn't wink at immorality of any kind. See, how do we react if a fellow believer is ensnared by sin and fares badly as a result? Love will not allow us to rejoice as if to say, good, he deserved it. No, we do rejoice, however, when a brother who has erred takes positive steps to recover from the spiritual fall. So notice the scripture again says, love does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. So that means we should avoid unclean entertainment, avoid pornography, Avoid unclean entertainment through books, television, and movies. Instead, do just the opposite. Rejoice and yield to the influence of Bible truth. The next expression, it says, love bears all things. The kingdom interlinear says is covering. So bears or covers all things. So let's look at image number three. As you look at your devices, you see a brother who is vacuuming cleaning in the kingdom hall, but look at the brother to his left. Uh, maybe he's imputing some bad motives toward his brother. Maybe he's allowing himself to think he needs to get busy cleaning this kingdom hall. But look at our brother. See, he's actively having stimulating conversation with the brother and his son in the congregation. But now look at the picture on the right. The brother who may have had some negative thoughts about our brother is now smiling as you see him in the background in the image on the right. See, he sees our brother is not so involved with perfunctory duties where he's neglecting showing love to fellow ones in the congregation as we see him assisting our elderly sister into our vehicle or into her vehicle. So when we look at that illustration, see, that's helping us to appreciate that love covers all things. According to some Bible scholars, the verb is related to the Greek word for roof. So like a watertight roof, love will cover over the imperfections of others and we'll see the good in our brothers and sisters. You can take that image down. Thank you so much. Our next expression says love believes all things. Now that means love is not gullible, but love is trusting. It does not impute bad motives. See, this type of love trusts in Jehovah God his word, and his organization. Moffat's translation renders it this way, always eager to believe the best. So we're not unduly suspicious of fellow believers. We don't question our brothers every moment. No love will help us to believe the best about our brothers and to trust them. The next expression says love hopes all things. So even as love is trustful, love is also hopeful. So motivated by love, we hope the best for our brothers. Uh, we make that evident when we pray for our dear brothers in Russia, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Eritrea, and other places. See, that type of love hopes all things. Uh, we're hoping that our brothers will be able to survive the persecution and remain faithful and maintain their integrity to Jehovah. Even if a loved one goes astray, we don't give up hope that someday he will come to his senses and return to Jehovah, just like the prodigal son in Jesus' illustration. So this type of love that hopes all things, this type of love is positive, it's cheerful, it's forward-looking. It moves us to pray and work for the best in any situation. Yes, this type of love helps us to hope in all of Jehovah's promises. The next expression says, love endures all things. So endurance is a very important quality for us as servants of Jehovah. Endurance enables us to stand firm 
in the face of disappointments or hardships. At times, we may be even tested within the Christian congregation. Because of imperfection, our brothers may on occasion disappoint us. It could be a thoughtless remark that may hurt our feelings. Perhaps a congregation matter is not handled as we think it should be. The conduct of a respected brother may be upsetting, could even cause us to wonder, how could a Christian act like that? When faced with such challenges and such situations, what will you do? Will you withdraw from the congregation and stop serving Jehovah? Not if we have love. Yes, love can endure anything that Satan and his demon brothers will throw at us to try to test our devotion to Jehovah. How fitting the Apostle Paul concludes with the expression, love never fails. So love will never come to an end. It will never cease to exist. Why? First John chapter four, verse eight. Jehovah is a God of love. And he's also the king of eternity, according to the scriptures. So as obedient humans, we will have an opportunity to display this type of love throughout all eternity. So this way of love will never end. It will never be lacking. So we think about love never failing. Think about ones in the congregation that we can actively show love to. As you look at image number four, as you look at your devices, you notice our sister is helping an elderly sister in the congregation, and this is an act of love. You notice she has a big smile on her face. She's making some minor repairs in the sister's home. Now look at the sister in the background. The homeowner is so happy. She's pleased to receive this type of loving help. So right now, we may not be able to go into the homes of our brothers and sisters because of the coronavirus pandemic. But it may be a good idea to talk to your group overseer or talk to the elders to see uh, in what ways can I be of help to our elderly brothers and sisters, uh, maybe helping them with shopping or buying groceries for them or making sure they get to their appointments, medical appointments on time and so forth. But always check with your group overseer or elders so that they can give us good direction in that regard. That way we stay healthy and safe during this pandemic. You can take that picture down. Thank you so much. So we've covered a lot when we think about love. There are so many ways that we can express love within our family circle and within the congregation. But let's look at a scripture that helps us frame. Please turn in your copy of the Bible with me to Colossians chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Again, that's Colossians chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely. Even if anyone has a cause for complaint against another, just as Jehovah freely forgave you, you must also do the same. But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. So this scripture ties in nicely, it coincides nicely with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. But let's focus in on Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, the latter part of the verse. It tells us that love is a perfect bond of union. So this love is so strong that it could be likened to the powerful bonding agent of the acorn bonder. Let's pull up image number five. Now, as you look at your devices, you will see the picture of the acorn barnacle. Now, the acorn barnacle has one remarkable ability. It knows how to stick to things. What is its secret? It makes a glue so strong that a film a mere three ten thousandths of an inch thick has a sheer strength of seven pounds per square inch. Anyone who's tried to pry a barnacle from his chosen mooring will testify to the strength of this powerful bonding agent. As you look at image number six, we'll pull, out, pull down image five and look at our last image number six. See that powerful bonding agent is the glue the acorn barnacle secretes. Now we think about what Colossians chapter three, verse 14 says, what is our glue? It is love. 
Notice the scripture says, because it is a perfect bond of you. So just like the lowly acorn barnacle, you and I have an opportunity to express this type of love within our family and in the congregation. You can take that picture down. Thank you so much. So we think about what Jehovah inspired the Apostle Paul to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. When we endeavor to apply that in our lives, we'll experience the blessings now. It will help us to attract others to Jehovah. We don't want to just express love to our family and brothers and sisters, but think about those who are not yet serving Jehovah. For example, a woman here in the United States was prejudiced against Jehovah's Witnesses, but she said this after meeting one, quote, I really don't remember what we talked about, but what I remember is how kind she was to you and how hospitable and humble she was. I really felt drawn to her as a person. End of quote. So when we think about that type of love, see, it can attract others to true worship. And when we exhibit that type of love, we're actually doing what Proverbs chapter 19 Verse 17 says, Proverbs 19, 17 tells us, the one showing favor to the lowly is lending to Jehovah, and he will repay him for what he does. It sounds very similar to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, which tells us Jehovah God is not unrighteous to forget the work and the love we show for his name by ministering and continuing to minister to the holy. Yes, Jehovah will repay us for showing love to others, and Jehovah God will not forget the love we show for his name. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, visitors and Bible students with us today, everlasting life is what Jehovah offers to those who continue to show love in this lawless world.